thinking about that song and today's title for this sermon is God's hope God's hope and then we sing about how wonderful God is and it's just an amazing we have so many things that we can be happy for I tell you uh, I was walking in this morning and uh, and I know she meant it in all funniness um, one of the ladies said hey I like the dress you're wearing pastor you know um, yes my jackets are starting to get a little bit big uh, but it's too expensive to have them altered right now. I'm going to wait about another 25 pounds. You know, or, you know, I'll just give them to Jeremy. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. You know, we have so much to be hopeful for. And, you know, we're still in the beginning weeks of 2019. And in the last nine months, we've, we've seen so many things that God has done. But, you know, you look back in the history, and I, I've been reading a wonderful book that someone brought me about the history of the church. And, you know, there's been a lot of despair, but there's also been a lot of glory. And there's also been a, a lot of strengths. And, and we've seen that during the low times, we, we really needed God's strength to come and say, Listen, I, I know it's hard right now as a church, but I haven't left you. See, even in our lives, we get to a time and we're in so much despair. God's looking at us from heaven. He said, do you not hear me anymore? Do you, you're not alone. God's never going to let his church. God's never going to let his people. God's never going to let his children. Listen, God's never going to let you, if you believe in him, if you put your faith in him, he's never, ever going to leave you alone. You think, well, he's beating me up. Well, you know, sometimes when we were kids, we had to be put in line with our mom and dad. Now, your parents may do things differently than my parents did. My dad had a real good way of putting us in line. Y'all look across the south and you see these beautiful golden bell bushes. They're getting ready to start blooming. How many of y'all know what a golden bell bush is? That is not beautiful. That's a switch bush. You can swing that thing a hundred times. It's not going to break. And if it does, there's a thousand of them more in one bush to go pull another one that you get to pick. Pick the right one. You know what? Praise the Lord for parents that are willing to make sure they love their children enough these days to keep them in line. You know, I, I didn't like it back then, but whew, Lord God, my Father in heaven, Stanley, Thank you for the spiritual. Thank you for the physical. And thank you for allowing us to always see that there is hope in our Father in heaven. Amen. See, we've seen earthly lives come to an end since I've been here. I've done almost 24 funerals. But you know, even in the sadness of the funerals, when I'm up there, sometimes people will say, you know, you... You, you talk about these people and we're grieving and, and you're smiling. And it's because even though I don't know the people as well here as you do, I always ask this simple question, were they saved? And I say, yes, mama was saved. Yes, daddy was saved. Yes, my aunt or my niece was saved. And I just smile knowing that even though we're grieving here, they're walking in heaven and all these years of hope that they held on to, now they're not only even holding on to it, they're walking with it. Yet through it all, we have seen God with us every step of the way. You know, we, we look at these baptisms. We're getting ready to do one at 11 o'clock. We're going to be doing baptisms the next two weeks after this. We look at the lives that are changed. We look at the ministries that are in this church. And we see everywhere, we've seen everything multiply. Not multiply because of what we are doing, but what God is doing through us rather. You know, and it's a blessing to be able to see that. And we do it because we have hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's all about hope. See, we have faith, and we have faith because we know that there is hope being given to us through this faith. We know that God promises this hope. He, he promises us hope. He extends the hope. He gives us hope. And we always know there's a better tomorrow. We always know there's a brighter future, whether it's walking one more day on this planet or taking our four, first step on the golden streets of heaven above. There's always hope. But, you know, we'll, we'll let the world get to us. We'll, we'll, we'll see the dark shadows and we see Satan lurking in them and we feel like the shadows are getting closer. Well, all you've got to do is turn up 
the light just a little brighter. But you've got to understand what this hope is. How do we turn this light up any brighter than it can be? See, we need hope, not wishing hope or maybe hope. No, rather a hope of confidence. Our text today in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, Paul wrote the book of Romans to a people that needed much encouragement and most of all hope. And that text that we have here today is the same text that we're looking, that they looked at, that they gathered hope from, that we gather hope from. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read God's Word. In Romans chapter 15, verse 13, God's Word says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound. Not that you may skip, Not that you may just think about it, but the Bible says abound, abound. If you can't get excited about hope in Jesus Christ in your life, I know we got to finish one more word, but it says abound. Did you wake up this morning and jump out of the bed? Well, I didn't because I didn't really go to bed, but I would have. But it says abound. In hope, let us pray. God, I pray as we move forward, Lord, let your word be heard. And God, I pray that every man, woman, and child, every youth, Lord, every soul will be touched by this Holy Spirit and have a better understanding of what this hope is that you give. In Christ's name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we understand, when we look at the word hope, as it refers to God, I want you to hear this. It means earnest expectations, confidently anticipating or unwavering confidence. Do you walk in all three of these in your life? Do you have an understanding when it helps with these three things and it says an earnest expectation? You can expect good things from God because God says, I have a life for you and I have a life for you more abundantly. We can understand that we can walk confidently. Uh, confidently in the anticipation that it's coming because God don't lie. Amen? God only gives truth. Amen? Now the devil, that old sorry son of a gun, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a snake in the grass. Literally. If you remember, just a few weeks ago, the Bible described him as a lion waiting to devour you. But God says that we can earnestly expect and confidently anticipate and walk in unwavering confidence. You know, so many people will say, Pastor, you know, I want this confidence that you have. I have no confidence in myself. I have the confidence of Christ that's in myself that allows me to walk the path of righteousness. Outside of Christ, there's nothing special outside of a lump of skin here with chiseled cheeks and a perfect goatee. Lightly colored when needed. I know y'all been talking about it. I ain't a secret. It says just for me and I use it. I'm a man. Here's the thing. We walk confidently because we understand that what's walking in us, what's filling us, is the hope that abounds. Are you walking in that hope that abounds in your life? Do you do it every day? Are you doing it even now? Are you sitting in this pew even now worried about tomorrow when God didn't even promise it to you? Lord, the house payment was due on the 1st. We're already halfway through the month and I don't even know how I'm going to make it before the 30th before it goes on my credit report. We're more worried about a number that the world gives us to put us in check than a Holy Spirit that comes and dwells on us that checks us in eternity. See, I'm not saying paying your bills on time isn't important. If God put it in front of you, you should do what God puts in front of you. If you put more than you can bear, then get rid of some of this stuff. But when it starts pulling your hope of life away, where you can't even confidently hear God's word and walk in it, some changes need to be made. When Paul describes hope to the Roman people, I want you to notice what he does. He calls God the God of hope. What does that mean to us today? How does that encourage those that are having difficult times, struggling to make it to the next day, the next hour, or even just the next moment? 
Here's what Paul was trying to state here. As God leads Paul to pen these words of hope. See, God is an author of hope. He is the author of hope because he penned this beautiful book which brings us hope, which brings us direction, which brings us love. And you know what? It even brings correction, but it's correction out of love. If someone was ever going to write a book on hope, it would have to be God. You see, it's not just one of many, but he is the only one that could do it. All others that define hope, they are copycats of God. He's the only one that can bring you hope and that can keep every promise. God wrote this book, and it comes to you in the words of hope. No other one else can ever come to you and say, I bring you something that's going to bring you hope for all eternity. There's not another book out there that can promise you eternity and hope. And if it is, they're plagiarizing God's Word, the inspired Word of God, when God penned it in His book. We understand that we find hope in many different things. We can use Noah. There's many I could use, but I'm going to use Noah. When God told Noah to build an ark, that he was going to destroy the world, but he would spare him and his family, Noah did as he was told. In Genesis chapter 6, it says, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Nobody else on this planet was worthy. But God... Look to Noah. You know, Noah was always looking to God. And God saw something special in him. But here's the thing. Noah didn't just hear him. He obeyed. How many of y'all would start building an ark of gopher wood, if you could find it, right now? For decade after decade after decade. See, he did it. They would come and they would scoff at him and they would mock at him and they would ridicule him. Not just him, but his wife, his children, and their wives. <clears throat> it's a boat in the middle of nowhere. It's going to be a dinner cruise through the woods. I can just imagine the things they were saying to him, but he never wavered because he heard God speak to him, and he knew what he was instructed to do. You know, God's still instructing people to do things for him today, even in this room right now. Even in this room right now, God is instructing each and every man and woman and child and youth in this room right now that has a heartbeat and a soul. He is giving you some type of art to build. And he's not looking you to waver in any way. He wants you to stand confidently and knowing that he gave you this mission because he expects you and only you to accomplish it. He gave it to you. Noah had faith in what God told him. It was unwavering confidence. He had hope. And it was in God and it was in no other. What about Moses? God told Moses to lead his people out of slavery. In Exodus chapter 3 it says, And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He didn't just... Well, maybe a little bit in the beginning. He understood he was walking on holy ground. And he finally accepted the mandate. Was he scared? Was he anxious? I wasn't there. I couldn't tell you. But I know we sent Aaron to help him. But he followed the instructions it says, now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. He heard his people crying. He heard their prayers. I want to ask you today, have any of you, you don't have to raise your hand, I'm just asking you, have any of you cried to God in heaven just this past week? If you have, God heard you. You weren't just crying to the ceiling and praying to the ceiling and wishing to the ceiling. He's an all-powerful God of hope, and he hears you. And he's sending some way to lead you out of whatever it is that has you into some type of bondage or slavery. Are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to follow? He's always willing to give hope. Moses did as God commanded. A poor speaking disabled slave did as God was asked and had a hope of great anticipation that God would do all that he said he would do. Then after many signs and wonders that God did through Moses, the people 
of Israel were set free. See, here's the great thing about God. If he does it for someone else, he's going to do it for you. If he sets someone else free, he'll set you free. You need to be set free from addiction, he'll set you free. But see, he didn't set them free in the land they were at. They had to be willing to get up and move. Staying where they were at meant they would stay in slavery, in bondage. But God said, I'm going to send you a leader. I'm going to send you away. All you have to do is follow. They had to leave where they were at. There's going to be something in your life that you're going to have to leave to go to a better place that God is calling you. Well, pastor, what would that be? It's different for everyone, but he will set you free. That's what he does. Because he's a God of hope. God always is looking for the best for his people. In Exodus 12, it says, All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Folks, I can go on about every other wonderful example of where people follow God in the Bible. This wonderful book that we call the inspiration, that we call the living word, that we understand God directs us by, is something that we can find our hope in. The point is, is that God is the author of hope. God knows how to install people with hope. He knows how to give encouragement to his children, if you're willing to accept it. My friends, there is no hope apart from God. If your hope is in anything else, it will falter. People will fail you. Things will break down. Governments do fall. Countries do pass. Land does shake. It does rumble. It does fall into the sea. But the hope of Christ lives on for all eternity. What are you putting your hope in? Anything other than, that, other than the hope of Christ is just an empty promise. Promises that fall short from one another. You see, God is the author of hope because he is the foundation of hope. He is the foundation of hope. What do I mean of the foundation of hope? What it means is that there is nothing else at all that we can rest our hope in. He is the foundation. It doesn't matter what the economy does. We will not waver. Who is in charge of the government? We will not worry. When the wars arise, we will not be moved. Our hope is in God and Jesus Christ. Christ is the root of all our well-being. Not our government handouts, our campaign promises, the stock market's highs and lows, our jobs, our talents, and our own abilities. Our foundation is on nothing other than that of Christ. Do you step on that foundation every day? What are you finding your security in? You know, if you're a married couple, you should find your security in your marriage of that of Christ. It's not in your job. It's not in your bank account. Ever since my girls went to college, I don't even know what it means to have $20 in my wallet. I mean, they can snip five hours away and they can sniff it out. Part hell. But you know, I just don't worry about things when I know that everything in my life is that of Christ. You know, everything is that of Christ. It's a wonderful thing when you get up in the bed in the morning and you abound in hope, knowing no matter what happens, God's got you. Well, I'm getting the test results back today. God's got you. Well, I don't know if I'm going to have a job today or not. God's got you. Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to stretch this $1 into $10. God's got you. Just praise the Lord that he's never let you fail. See, his basket doesn't have any holes in it. The only thing about his basket with the holes, it allows the sin to wash through and the righteousness of you to stay in it. We understand that he is the foundation of our hope. We know that when we stand, we stand on the foundation of God and God alone. There is nothing stronger than the promises of God. In John chapter 17, 24, it says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, 
may be with me where I am. In other words, he's telling God, I want them where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in heaven and I want them in heaven. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Before the world was ever created, the foundation of God's kingdom reigned. Long before this planet was formed, long before any thought of anything was given, God's foundation for eternity was there and you were on his mind. Well, I just, I just, I just, that's hard to fathom. That's why he's God and you're not. Stop trying to put yourself in his throne. It's an honor just to be next to the throne. It's an honor to be loved by someone who will always love you, no matter how imperfect you are. I can put my foundation in something like that. I had some of the greatest friends in the world let me down. You probably have too. But Christ has never let me down one time. Not once in my life. I've never seen him let anyone down. Well, he took a mom. He took a dad. He took a child. What do you say about that, Pastor? I don't know God's ways. His ways are not my ways. But I do know. He brings his people home. And the loss that we experience here is short, it's temporary, but the love will be eternal because our foundation is grounded in the eternal one. Do you walk in that? Do you feel that? 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For no one can come lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is the builder of our hope. He's the builder of our hope. Everything we have is built on the hope of Jesus Christ. Everything we do is through his guidance and his leadership. Now listen to that. Everything we do is through the guidance and leadership that he provides. If you seek it. Do you seek it? I mean, do you really ask him about every little thing you do? Think about that for a second. Just go this past week. Did you make a decision that didn't quite work out and say, you know what, I probably should have prayed about that one. Probably should have done it. See, God tells us that he's going to give us guidance. He tells us that he's going to make sure that we're where we need to be. And he's going to tell us that how many times we've come to the end of something we were trying to build on our own and in our lives only to see it fall through our hands. And then we look back and we're like, God, why didn't it happen? And God's like, when you prayed, you did not pray for my will in your life for this decision. Well, your word says that if I pray to you, you'll give it to me. I will if it's in my will. Well, I don't understand. You know what God would have of you and what God would not have of you. God, we need a new car. I pray that you would lead us to it. I led you to a Chevy Malibu. It's a four-door. It's everything your family needs. But the Cadillac Escalade is so much nicer. It's only $45,000 difference. If we cut out everything in our life and we don't tithe and we only drink water and we only drink Kool-Aid, we can afford this. I'll just have to work overtime for the next five years and miss church. But you know I love you, God. Well, that, that wasn't the prayer that you brought to me. The prayer that you brought to me was that you would give a dependable car for your family or a nice home that you could feel safe in or a dependable job that would take care of you but still allow you to be in my will and work for my kingdom. But God, I want it my way. God's not a McDonald's or Burger King. He doesn't make it your way. His will for your life is his will for your life. If you ask for extra cheese and he doesn't want you to have it, you don't get it. Well, God, they got extra cheese. Their will is different for their life than yours. Well, I don't think it's fair. It's just. Well, you talk about that just thing a lot. We live with a just God. And when God is just, he is fair. Even though we may not see it, it's always fair when he's just to all. We understand that when God gives the example, 
He gives us strength in Psalms 37. The salvation of righteousness is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. He guides us in Psalm 32. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eyes upon you. He delivers us in Psalms 32. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve, preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And he protects us in Proverbs 18. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. You know, you might be getting beat up a lot in your life because you forgot you got a strong tower over here that you can run to. God never said you had to do it on your own. Well, I just want to be strong for the Lord. God didn't tell you to be strong. He said to be faithful. He said, I'll be your strength. I'll be your deliverer. I'll be your God. And I'll be your stronghold. When you do walk in faith with me, you are strong. You're God strong. And I'm not talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger strong. I'm talking about getting on your knees. And while you're on your knees, you're prayerfully strong, but you're standing in heaven with God who's saying, watch this. He's telling you, I love you, my friends. There are thousands of scriptures that I could share with you today. But what I want most is to encourage you to build your hope in and on the only one that can honestly live up to everything he claimed to be in your life. There's nothing that he claims in his word here that he will not expound on and guarantee in here. You try to point out one time and you'll see that God never failed you if you see it the way the scriptures proclaim it. If you're placing your hope in anything other than Jesus Christ, then your heart will be broke, your hope will be gone, And you'll be living a life of discouragement and disappointment. You see, when all is said and done, Christ is the only one that can live up to and finish the commitment. He's the only one. We got a world out here that says, until death do us part or until the next best thing comes. We got a world out here that says, I got your back until you turn around and realize... The only thing that's in it is a bunch of knives. You got a world that says, come on, if you just climb this hill, and then when you get on top, you find that there's a slippery slope on the other side. God doesn't say, I got your back. He says, I got your front, your back, the side. I got your top and your bottom. He says, I got you. There is no slippery slope with me. There is no until something better belts comes along. I am the best. He says, just hold on to me. Hold on to me. Because he is the finisher of our hope. There is no one present or past that can deliver like Christ has. God has deemed it so. You see, there are millions of people that hope they lived good enough. They hope they went to church enough. They hope they didn't go or do too much wrong. The hope that they follow the rules and regulations just right. All these will lead to you in your heart to an empty hope. If people are placing their hope in themselves, then they are hopeless. If you are living in any of these lives, then you are living in a hopeless life. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, Look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter. I love that word. I know Webster doesn't like it, but I love it. The perfecter. I should be a superhero. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before and endures the cross. What do you mean? Who for the joy that was set before endured the cross? Are you saying Jesus enjoyed going to the cross? No, he didn't enjoy going to the cross, but he knew the joy that was coming after the cross. It was you. You are the joy. And he endured the cross so his joy could be your joy so you and him could have joy for all eternity. You're the joy. Are you living like it? Are you abounding in it? Do you feel it? God is good. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
You know, Jesus says he's going to share that throne with us. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's going to be God. Then it's going to be Jesus. Then it's going to be all of us. You mean we're going to get to sit on the throne too? Yeah, and he's going to throw in crowns, mansions, and the tree of life and the living water for all eternity. Well, that's just hard to believe. Not when Jesus is in your heart. Because he lets you feel it when you're here on earth. Do you feel it even now? Or are you letting the earth overwhelm something that overwhelmed you a long time ago that you said you would never let go of? See, it is Christ and Christ alone who finished the work that needed to be done so that you could have hope, you could have a confidence that we can have an intimate relationship with God. See, I always come back to that word, intimate relationship. Are you in an intimate relationship with God? Do you speak to him and does he speak back to you? Let me go ahead and answer that question. He's always speaking back to you. Are you listening? Do you allow him to speak back to you? Do you just tell God what you want and what he needs to do? Or do you say, God, what do you want and what do you need me to do? We don't sit on the throne. But we do follow who sits on. My friends, where is your hope today? What is your confidence found in? See, have you placed it in the things of the world only to be disappointed time and time again? Is your heart a heart of hope or a heart of hopelessness? Have you asked yourself that? Have you done an inner search? Is your heart full of the hope of Christ? Or the hopelessness of this world. See, God loves you today. And God will bless you and touch your life. But you must first be willing to accept God's hope. And that's His Son, Christ. Would you stand?